Good morning, explorers, and welcome to episode 5 of The Filmmaking Behind, a series where we break down video game cutscenes to see how filmically they work and why. Last time you were given a choice between a video on both Pikmin 1 and 2, or just Pikmin 3, and results dictated that we're covering the Pikmin franchise from the early 2000s. If any of you are watching this at the time that this video comes out, then congratulations! You've got plenty of Pikmin content to enjoy. This week alone has me making three different Pikmin videos, and there's a new Pikmin game coming out this week, and other YouTubers are covering the franchise right now. Welcome to the Pikmin Harvest, everybody. It's probably going to be the only one ever. What's up, guys? It's Daz here, but you don't really care. Let's turn back time now, back to the original game released around 16 years ago, and start from there. So the camera begins with a simple pan across the stars, with some futuristic and mysterious music playing in the background, immediately setting up the fact that we're in space. The camera stops in place in preparation for Olimar's appearance right in the centre of the frame. He appears in a flash of light, not to tell us that he's some kind of godly character, though maybe there's a theory in there somewhere, but instead to keep up that futuristic feel as it's just his manner of space travel. It's how things work. And while he does begin tiny on the frame, this is not to make him seem unpowerful, but rather to emphasise his action of coming closer to the camera, and thus the scene and story. Here we see Olimar casually looking around, painting him as just an ordinary guy, and suddenly not someone with villainous intent or anything. We then get a cut to the next shot right as Olimar covers the entire frame. The first frame of the next shot also has the shot completely engulfed by the meteor. I guess you could maybe call this a match cut as the frame size is the same, but if there's another name for this kind of transition, let me know. I couldn't find a definition myself. Anyway, this meteor is shown to be opposing Olima, as you can tell by how it's moving away from the camera. Additionally, the music highlights a sense of dread or drama upon its appearance, telling us it's something to be concerned about. Back to Olima, and we see he's opposing the meteor more now as he moves from right to left, whilst the meteor moves left to right. Collision is imminent. And on impact, the music climaxes to emphasise the action. Next we see a shot of Olimar and his ship shooting directly downwards, initially from a close-up shot before the camera pans out to an extreme wide shot, including the giant and mysterious planet, as well as showing the ship lighting up as it enters the atmosphere, only adding more drama. And on an urgent sounding cacophony of music, we get a low angle shot of the ship plummeting to the planet in its fiery format, with chunks flying off in any which direction. This tells us clearly that the ship is falling apart, and so foreshadows the fact that the game's goal is to collect them all. The ship is also shown to be absolutely tiny here to emphasise just how little power it has across the entire environment it is falling onto. And the scene ends with the ship falling out of shot, with a distinct rumble on the ground and a fade to black on the world silhouette. And here is our first title card, introducing us to the name of the area we're in. This happens throughout the game every time you enter an area, but something I would like to mention here is the sound. It shows a great example of a J cut, which is where the sound of the next scene bleeds into the previous. In this case, the background music for this area begins towards the end of the title card and before we actually see the place. It adds a nice sense of fluidity to the transition away from the title card. And with a high angle motion shot, we see Captain Olimar collapsed on the floor. Tiny and looked down on at first because of his lack of power at this moment, but eventually at least a little bigger as he regains consciousness. Next shot, we're closer still and move to a head on position on him. Enough to actually see his actions and movements, before we pull back to see the wreckage of his ship. The tune that plays along this motion also seems to mimic Olimar's shock on the site. It has the same kind of notes you would expect Onima to verbally say, if that makes sense. And then we get a bulky chunk of text for the rest of the cutscene. I'll take that as a cue to move on. The first Pikmin Onion. In shot, the onion remains perfectly central to the frame, as it is the most important aspect of this scene. Onima can be seen a little lower on the frame as his significance is lower, though he attempts to walk into the onion himself. But first he's a little thrown off by the onion suddenly changing colour, and then again he's fully thrown backwards by the onion's activation. Now the camera pulls back to keep the entire onion in frame. Now Onima is even smaller than before. Next, the camera subtly closes in on the Pikmin Sprout. This isn't a complicated shot by any means, but its purpose is there to fully focus your attention onto it. What with the central framing and camera movements and all. And once it's plucked, we get a similar shot with the same motion. And with the first pellet, the camera simply follows the motions of the actions to highlight what's going on in an easy to digest format. Same with the first box. And to some degree, the first ship part too. 
And now we get one of 30 cutscenes showing the ship regain a part. It begins with a high angle on the ship before turning across and slowly lowering the angle of the shot. The turning action acts to add a little more emphasis and dynamicness to the shot, though obviously not a ton, whilst as usual the angle makes the ship seem a little more powerful as it's just been improved. And with the upgrading sequence there isn't actually a lot of camera movement, though the sparkles tell you enough. Olima appears from the left each time and the next shot closes in on him a little and shows his excitement for the upgrade before turning back up to the ship. Once again the sound copying his kind of tone. And now the end of day scene. The camera remains at a high angle, mostly to keep up the sense that liftoff is about to happen, and so we're looking down at the surface from the start. But also this is just the default angle for the game as it highlights the minor size of Olimar and the Pikmin. We see the Pikmin run after their onion, or follow Olimar if they were with him, as he moves towards the ship. Upon turning around and whistling, the camera pulls back further and turns to capture any Pikmin scattering behind Olimar and into the onions within the frame before pulling back a little more to show the entire scene of events in one frame. Onoma pops into a ship, the music is triumphant, and from another high angle we see the ship blast off into the sky, and the onions slowly following behind him. Upon entering a new area, the camera begins with a super high angle, turning on an axis, before normalising back down to a stable position. This works to establish the area nicely for the player so that they are not too disorientated initially, and helps them on their transition into gameplay. Here's the yellow onion. Filmically, it's pretty much the same as the reds, though do be aware of Olimar's actions. He starts to walk towards it, is jumped again by the bloom, and then quickly walks away from it again, clearly learning from his previous mistakes and jumping again at the jump out of the ground. The yellow Pikmin cutscene is identical to the reds. With future ship park cutscenes, the camera stays stable, but keeps its high angle on the scene. Sparkles tell you everything else. There's really not a lot of cutscenes, see? Here's the blue onion, identical to the yellow, as is the blue Pikmin cutscene. And now we're at the final cutscene, already. Bosses and all that have nothing, so this is literally the next one. Crazy. So, it begins with the final ship part being collected, this time with a much more head-on angle onto the ship. Power has been restored. With a final turn across the ship, we get a mini montage of close-ups to different parts of the ship, all restored and ready to go, with triumphant music to boot. And a final leap of excitement from Olimar, clearly charging up his spin this time. And with the final scene, we have the camera drop down from high up to super low, moving us into the final scene. With a slower, more emotional version of the End of Day song playing, we see Olima standing in his usual position to enter the ship. Next shot, we close up on him, head on, able to clearly see him turn around. The next shot shows his perspective of the Pikmin standing in a line and turning their heads along with the music somewhat. Olima waves, and the Pikmin kind of wave back. And with a final sigh, Olima is sucked back into his ship. The camera pulls back to show the motion. And with a turning low angle, the first in the game, we see the Pikmin looking up at Olimar's ship as it prepares to lift off. On a harsh high angle, we see the ship propel itself upwards, with the camera lifting to show the Pikmin watching from below. Moving closer to the Pikmin, we now see the impact Olimar has had on them as they run to the side and start attacking a wandering Bulborb. They leap into the air and are clearly winning the battle. The Bulborb runs away from the camera, which starts to lift up into the sky once more. And now the ship flies into space once again. Though this shot remains static, it does show a whole lot of other onions flying high up as well. Olimar's ship flies centre frame and moves directly towards the camera, once fully out of reach of the mysterious planet. We get a large wide shot of the ship flying across space and a close up on the ship before turning around to Olimar looking back to see the planet slowly fading into the distance. And the ship flies away from the camera and upwards out of frame. The end. Now honestly, I'm surprised this video is as long as it is considering how little cutscenes there are in Pikmin 1, but still, so far this video could be longer. So now we're diving into the world of Pikmin 2. To Hockertate we go. We begin with some triumphant trumpets, playing a kind of motif for Hockertate, or Olimar's theme, whilst the camera shows off the paths of the shipping company Hockertate Freight. We see their business banner and a brief summary of the story of Pikmin 1. The music is much more interactive with the visuals and it's all presented in quite a tongue-in-cheek format. For the most part though, it's just pictures. On to the actual cutscene. We see Olimar's ship flying calmly through space, with the camera panning to the left as the ship flies past. We get a little close up of Olimar tapping his fingers on the steering wheel he has. And we get a wide shot of the ship flying away from the camera and onto Hockertate, though we also get to see some neighbouring planets. We then get an establishing shot of Hockertate Freight, telling us the company is a little under right now. Their banner is old and broken. The environment bland and stripped, and papers just flying in the wind. The camera then slides to the right to reveal the ship landing on sight onto the scene. 
Next we get a high angle on the two characters, the President and Louis, one of which looks a little bit concerned. Here we see Olimar hopping out of his ship and immediately greeted by the President and his monologue. At this point the camera stays stable and the only visuals going on is the President's over the top actions and Louis's lack thereof. We then see a claw appear in the background foreshadowing the next act where in a wide angle we see Olimar's ship taken away from him, with some violins adding drama and a dying trumpet to add that sense of hopelessness. And big ol' text to really add emphasis to the debt. Now here is actually a really interesting shot. In reaction to the news, we see Onoma large on the frame lean back and drop his treasure. All the while the background fades completely to black before coming back. This really adds emphasis to Onoma's isolation and reaction to this moment and is really quite an advanced little technique. In the film world, this sort of technique is rare but really, really effective if done well. Connecting these next two shots is the rolling sound of the lid, which I thought was quite nice. And it comes into this shot here when it rolls into Louis, who looks up and out of shot, leading us to the next shot of the company ship, who begins talking. And then we get a wide shot of the ship sucking up the treasure, followed by a close up on the three characters letting us see the action more closely. And then back to the wide angle again. Back to the ship shot for more dialogue and drama, and then a reaction shot of the president after hearing its value. Suddenly that debt doesn't seem that impossible, as shown by the president's surprised logo up top. So with the adventurous music building, we get a new angle on the three characters together, all clearly having a spot on the frame, followed by the president's perspective pointing at Olimar to instruct the two to head on back to that planet. The final shot here shows a low angle wide shot of the president waving off the ship before he's blasted backwards as the two head off back to the Bakeman planet. We see an opposing shot of the ship leaving Hockatate compared to going in, a new shot of the ship going right across space before building up and to hyperspeed I assume, fading to white, flying in a new part of space, hopping over the meteor from the first game and returning once again to the Pikmin planet. There's a lot happening in those final moments but for the most part it's fancy visuals and a fantastic soundtrack. It's the action shot. And with the classic title card from the first game, we fade to the next scene. The ship flies from right to left through some wintry branch complex before the camera moves closer onto Olimar to prepare for a transition onto his perspective. We see branches become more and more of a hazard with the music adding to this further. Next we see Olimar react and brace for some kind of impact whilst Louis is dozily unaware and so is smacked right out on impact. And then from a high angle we see Louis spinning and falling to the surface as the ship attempts to make a safe landing. Also I've just noticed that the first frame of this shot even includes one of the caves in the area. Now that's foreshadowing, as is the rest of the view of this area. Upon landing we see Olimar chucked out of the ship on his front, whilst the ship is given its standard low angle upon its dialogue. Next we see Olimar look up to see some Pikmin attacking a dwarf Bulborb. Look at that progression from the first game. And once whistled, the camera stays static, but the music tells you the excitement of the moment and the close up allows you to clearly see Olimar's backflip of joy. Over to Louis and we see him walking right to left to an onion, which the camera pulls out to show in full view. Once it sprouts, the camera doesn't move, but again the music tells you the mystery of the moment and uses a kind of Pikmin theme motif. And on close up we see Louis's eyes bulge out to show his surprise at the sprout. Pretty simple stuff. And now the Pikmin has been plucked, it looks directly at the camera as this is Louis's perspective and we're very close up to see all of its little movements of curiosity. We then see a funny scene of Louis being a little afraid of the Pikmin and running away from it, all the while the Pikmin follows and the sound of Louis's march is playing, kind of foreshadowing the mechanic. The scene ends with the two looking directly at the camera, which is more of a common thing for Louis to do in this game, which I guess the Pikmin is just mimicking. Next up we're jumping to the discovery scene, now there's a lot of these so I'll just cover the first one. The camera movements are all the same anyway. Basically the camera stays up high and moves forward to look at a certain point of interest before moving closer towards it. All the while a music expelling a sense of curiosity plays. This is used for every cave or new thing. So now the purple Pikmin cutscene. For this the camera stays close up to emphasise all of their actions, meanwhile the camera is slowly turning across the Pikmin to add a small sense of dynamic motion to the scene. For the white Pikmin cutscene the camera is of course close up again, but this time it stays head on and slowly moves closer and closer to the Pikmin, meanwhile its actions foreshadow some of its abilities. For the yellow Pikmin cutscene the camera remains close and head on and tracks the Pikmin's movements as it jumps off of the tree. With the blue Pikmin the camera actually starts with a wide angle before coming closer as it's an extended discovery cutscene that plays first, showing them treading water and attacking wall poles. On the actual cutscene the camera movement is the same as the whites. And upon discovering the Bulbmin, the same is true as well. 
Now there's no cutscenes for bosses or anything else other than entering a new area, which is a pretty simple moving shot foreshadowing the area. So now we're going to jump over to the debt being repaid cutscene. The camera starts up close on the ship before pulling back to show Olimar and Louis standing before it. Next it aims at the sky to show a single dot, presumably representing Hockatate, and the president's face, showing he's in that direction and eagerly awaiting their arrival. It's even placed under his eye to show his emotional happiness. We once again see the ship fly far away from the planet and zoom towards the camera. We get a head-on shot of the ship with it placed on the left side of the frame as the planet vanishes in the background on the right. We get another shot focused on Onimer as he turns back to see a representation of the Pikmin on the planet, each getting bigger for some reason. And also the stars are trailing to show the ship's acceleration. Then we come back to Onimer who turns away, and then turns back again because none of the previous shots allowed us to see the fact that... The music of course adding to the missing element in the scene before being taken away on some space journey. And we see a final shot of the Pikmin planet, this time keeping that sense that there's still more to be done. Now the credit sequence is pretty basic, the camera stays mostly static and simply shows a series of real life shots where Louis is placed in the world before a final shot of Louis looking over the horizon and turning once again directly to the camera, awaiting you to come find him. Back to Hockatate though and we get a similar wide shot of the claw, now taking away the last of the treasure we've collected. We see Olimar and the President in a closer shot next which seems more weighted to the right hand side of the frame due to Louis not being in his normal position. And with another pointing perspective we see an empty shot of where Louis is supposed to be, accompanied with a dying horn. So the music builds up once again for the reveal that... <laughs> with a lovely close up of the president's face. And now we jump to the final cutscene as not even the final boss has a cutscene, just a slow move in on Louis on top of the treasure. So, it begins with an extreme close up of the underbelly of the ship as it prepares for liftoff, really adding to that build up as the machine is literally whirring into action. The screen then fades to white as the ship propels itself, which takes us to the next shot of a super low angle of the Pikmin looking up at the ship in the sun setting sky the lights and their bodies glowing beautifully. We then move on to a head-on shot of the ship going up, whilst we see the ground beneath them become smaller and smaller. Next is a close-up of Olimar and the President, enveloped in gold. The President is laughing with the aspect of money, whilst Olimar only cares about the Pikmin. Next we see the ship flying over the surface, with its reflection occasionally appearing in the water. Back to Olimar and we see his eyes bulge in surprise of his view of the surface. Jumping to what he sees, it's revealed that the Pikmin are positively glowing. So brightly it even reflects off of the ship. As the music swells with emotion, we see the Pikmin are all looking up and swaying to and fro in unison. Back to Wanamer again and he turns up in view of the three onions following him for a final send off. Sparkles flying everywhere. And with the final triumphant trumpet playing, the ship comes back into shot in preparation for the final stretch. Whereby it flies directly upwards as the onions disband high up in the sky. And as we've been seeing throughout the entire time, the ship flies above all else and pushes forward to go directly into the camera and with a final enveloping shot transition, we see the Pikmin planet in its full glory, slowly pulling away. And with that, I think I've said enough. So I hope you've enjoyed this little analysis of Pikmin 1 and 2's cutscenes, and if you'd like to see more content from me, then check out the cards on screen in a moment. Or if you'd specifically like Pikmin things, check out the links in the description. And if you'd like something more involved in the filmmaking behind series, then you're in luck. You get to decide what game we're going to cover next week. So you can vote using the card poll in the top right hand corner of the video if you haven't already. This week your options are a video on Shadow of the Colossus or Monster Hunter. Either way, we're going to be fighting something very, very big with a camera that's very, very small. Anyway, if you choose to, then please do follow me on Twitter, email me through Hotmail, or support me on Patreon to support what I do. All three of those go by the name of Daz Videos. Cause for now, my name's been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit.